Hey everyone, and welcome to the biggest thing probably our church has ever done, Arise. And we're gonna get right into the message of this week, just in a moment, but I wanna take just a moment and say, Thank you for taking this journey with us. And I also want to speak to a group of people who are not in our city, but we hear from you through email or through letters. And some of you even give. You give faithfully uh, to our church and you're a part of our church. And maybe that's through the podcast or maybe now you're going to be able to engage with us through video. And I want to say thank you for being a part of us because the kingdom of God knows no limits and the family of God has no bounds. And so uh, we love hearing from you. And if God is using this ministry in any way to change your life, we love hearing from you. We love knowing you're a part of us. And we want now to invite you to be a part of our family. And we're working to upgrade some things and, and get video and some streaming and some other things going on so you can engage with us even on a new level. And as our church steps into, for us, one of the biggest seasons we've ever had as a church, I want to invite you those of you who are a part of our extended family you're not in our city but you listen to our podcast and now maybe you're watching the videos and and I want to invite you to be a part of arise with us to take this journey with us and see how God is calling you to arise and even invite you to say hey you don't have to give anything but you get to. And if you would like to support this next season of ministry where we're going to be able to ramp up our online presence and ramp up um, the engagement opportunities that we can offer for those who are outside of our city and even outside of our country, um, I want to invite you to be a part of this journey with us. And so if you want to give, if you want to sow, if you're fed by this ministry or you consider us a part of your family, we consider you a part of our family. We want to hear from you. And I just invite you to take this opportunity to arise where you're at and see what God can do through you. And now let's go to this week's message. And you picked a great weekend. If you're um, hanging out with us, you picked a great weekend because last weekend we stepped into one of our biggest defining moments ever as a church. And that is we're taking our next steps. We're calling it arise one many lives but one movement and and what we launched last week and hopefully if you weren't here you listen to the podcast or now you can watch the messages uh, online and so maybe you watched it online or YouTube or however you do that but they're there on the website or YouTube in fact we have a YouTube channel now this I didn't know you could have a YouTube channel that's how I'm, I'm not a YouTuber but um, <clears throat> I do thank God for YouTube because I wouldn't know how to fix my car or my washer or my dryer without YouTube <clears throat> how many are with me on that one and so thank God for it. But anyways, now we're on there. And so hopefully you watch the message. But just to catch you up, we, we last weekend, uh, we're using the next five weeks starting last weekend. So we have four weeks um, as a launching pad for the next 24 months, for the next two years. And uh, we launched this initiative called Arise. And it has some targets, but those targets really are number one, we want to always disciple and empower people. Number two, we want to expand our reach. We want to reach more people. And number three, we want to build our first campus. We're ready to move into a little bit more permanent home. How many would say amen to that? We're ready. Like we have loved this building. We have squeezed all the goody out of it, but it would be nice if we could have more than 12 people in our foyer. And it would be nice if we had room for all the babies and we didn't have to right now. Some of your kids are Velcroed to a seat. And, and we want you to know they're loving it, but it would be nice if we had some more space. Somebody say amen, right? And so, and we need, we need space for our dream team, for nursing mothers, for kids, uh, for our teenagers. We just, we've got space problems. And so um, it's just time. And we felt like uh, the elders and I just felt like, you know, as we approach this year and Julie and I have been praying, we just said, hey, you know, this is the year there's destiny on it. Let's take our next steps. And so we put together this thing called Arise and you're in week two of it. I'm so glad that you're here. And so let me explain kind of because a lot of people are saying, how does this work? Well, first of all, our goal is really always discipleship. Our goal is always this. Our primary goal is we want every person that calls themselves a pathway person to participate in in a rise. And what I mean by that is I want you in a life group. Hopefully you're in one. If not, you can find one. We'll help you find one today. Um, but we want everybody in a life group. Um, and we want everybody tracking with us on the weekends. And we're just taking this journey together of taking our next steps into what God has called us and created us for. Now, obviously, part of discipleship is stewardship. 
And so, you know, here's, here's the bottom line of this is that um, we put together what it would cost, what our budget would be for the next 24 months based on what God's asked us to do. So in the next 24 months, we believe God's asked us to continue growing and operating our church. He's asked us to, to actually expand some things in outreach, and he's asked us to build our first campus. And so what we did, if you, if you have your book, you, you can see this in here. But if you, you start on page seven, that kind of starts talking about the Arise Initiative, and it shares a couple of scriptures that God spoke to, uh, to me uh, years ago, um, and, and really Julie, but I remember the morning he spoke to me, and I shared them with Julie what God was speaking. Um, but Exodus said, let them make a sanctuary that I could dwell among them. But then this um, scripture in 1 Chronicles, this is how we named it Arise, by the way, is it says this in 1 Chronicles twenty two nineteen. 19, it says, now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. There Therefore, arise and build the sanctuary of the Lord. And I just think that if we're ever going to do for God's kingdom to be established on this earth, people have to arise. And so that's where it came from. But if you, if you turn the page, you start seeing the, the economics of it. It explains the, the kind of the, the vision, the one movement, the one fund. But if you get to, um, where did that go? You'd think I know I wrote it. I've went too many pages here. There it is. If you get to page eight, I skipped that page. Page eight, it starts talking about what the budget is for us for 24 months. And so for us, it talks about, hey, to continue operating our church and, and to continue moving forward for the next 24 months, our budget for that is $2.8 million. And then if we look at the building and what we need to do to, to build that building and establish it, then that's uh, $8 million. And then when you look at what we want to do, expanding and outreach, that's 380000 And so you can read what all of that means. And so what we said is since we have one vision and one mission, then we're just going to have one fund for 24 months. So it doesn't mean, uh, in other words, we're not going to ask you to have a tithe and an offering and a building commitment and an outreach commitment. We're just going to say, hey, we're going to put all this together. We have one mission. We have one fund. And so those of us who give are just going to give one number, right? We're going to have one number. It's going to go to all of that. And, and so... Um, the one number is, like when you add all of that up, if you did the math in your head, but we'll put it up here. This is one mission, one fund. The one number is 11.74 million. You've already given a half a million without even really being asked to do that. And so we're at 10.74 million. That's to operate the church for two years, to give to our outreach partners and do all we want to do in outreach for two years and to build the building. Now, I know that seems like a big number. It seems like a lot of money, right? And, and it is, it's a lot of money. But I don't want you to worry about the big number because I want you to worry about what God's speaking to you. And this is what you need to understand. I will never ask you to do more than God asks you to do. I will also never ask you to do less than what God asks you to do. And I wish, here's what I would say, I wish that the kingdom of God could be built without sacrifice. But it can't. Right? We're all here because of a sacrifice. God had to put his son on a cross. It was your cross. It was my cross. And so the kingdom of God, I wish could be built without sacrifice. I, I wish, can I just tell you, I wish that I could pastor this church without sacrifice. This church has cost, cost me a lot. It's cost Julie a lot. It's cost us a lot. I wish it could be done, but the kingdom of God is not built without sacrifice. And I know there are some people and, and, and they will be a little bit shallow and they will say, well, this is just all about money and the pastor just wants your money and I can't help those people, so I'm not going to talk to them. I'm going to talk to the rest of you that want to change the world. Amen. I'm going to talk to the ones that want, to, that want to move. See, we think, if we're naive, we're going to think the offering is about a building. No, the offering is about your faith. Yes. God doesn't use giving to build buildings. He, gives guilt, he, he uses giving to build your faith. And we're naive, we're going to think God needs our money, and this is some kind of hostage situation, and he just wants a building. And God's like, no, I want you to live in faith. That's why I instituted giving. And we need to understand that, listen to me very carefully, giving and discipleship are synonymous. And I can't, you know, I, I kind of came up here today and I just thought, you know, I can't help it for the ones that want to criticize and want to tell me all I want is money. Hey, my family's saved. I'm really comfortable. I have a good salary. I like only doing three services. If we get beyond three services, we can just buy another screen and I'll just do them via video because I'm tired. I, this is, it has nothing to do with me. I don't need anything. 
But it's like I told you last week, Julie and I have committed, when we, when we bought the land as a church, God asked us to give all of our savings, and we did. And now that we're stepping into this, God's asked us again to, to commit all of our savings to this building. I don't need anything. God doesn't need me, but I sure like it when God uses me. And I sure like it when God builds my faith. And so, you know, all I can say is if you're wherever you're at today, you probably should hug a hater because those negative energy people kind of propel you on a little bit. And so those people that want to make it all about that stuff, that's fine. Praise God. Sometimes you just got to shake it off. That's what the psalmist said. Haters going to hate, but you just got to shake, shake, shake it off sometimes. And, and I can remember, I remember when we were in the Ramada and I was looking at a handful of people and said, one day, this is what God put on my heart. And it's still what God's put on my heart. We're going to reach 10,000 people in this city. And they're like, no one's ever had a church of 10,000 people. I'm like, I know that's why God asked us to do it because no one else has done it yet. Somebody else already done it. We need to be somewhere else. Right. And those people say, man, you're crazy. And now we're like 13, 1400. And they're like, well, I don't know, maybe we're crazy. <laughs> and one day they'll come to one of our campuses and they'll drink some of our coffee and they'll sit in one of our, our buildings and God will touch their life and they'll say, my God, that boy must have heard from God. I don't know what happened. <laughs> right? So hug a hater. Sometimes you need them. But, um, but I think God's called us to do something extraordinary. And I wish, I wish that it could be done without sacrifice. But it just can't. And people said, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? Well, I'll tell you how we're going to do it. You're, you're going to do exactly what God tells you to do. And I don't know what God's going to tell you to do. And, and for some of you, what he's going to tell you to do is not going to be very comfortable. It's not very comfortable for me. I'd rather be in Hawaii. Amen. Somebody say Honolulu. <laughs> I want to go there. Thank you, Lord. Anyway, so um, that was a holy moment. So to help you, to help you, and, and by the way, I'm walk, every week I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how this is going to happen, but, but if you want to look on page 12, this is, this is kind of the next step in our conversation. And we called it the giving, the giving ladder, the giving ladder. I, I wish that the kingdom of God could be accomplished and, and built without sacrifice, but it can't. Here's something you need to understand. Discipleship and stewardship are synonymous. Discipleship, and we try to separate the two because we're okay with being disciples we just don't want God to get any of our money. It's always so funny to me when people say, I can trust God with all my life. I just can't trust him with a tithe. I'm like, okay, I hear you. We've all been there, but that's where we need to grow. We don't want to stay there. God loves you just where you're at, just how you are. And he loves you so much, he won't leave you there. And can I tell you a cool story? This is a story about one of our teenagers and so we have this family in our church, wonderful family. And, uh, and uh, the, the mother in this family, I'm not going to use names, obviously, but the mother in this family was um, t sharing a story with Julie, and she shared it with me, and then I ran it by Pastor James, and he was verifying parts of it. But essentially, there's this family, and they have two teenage girls, and, and, and they, um, uh, one of the girls had gotten a job, and they said, you know, now that you have a job, you ought to start tithing. You need to be a steward. We have a value here that we are stewards, because stewardship and discipleship are synonymous. And, of course, she was a teenager, so she didn't start tithing because she went to math class, and she found out, if I give it away, I don't have it anymore. And that doesn't seem like a good deal. You know what I mean? Like, Johnny had 10 apples. He gave one apple away. Now he only has nine apples. And so, um, but, but this cool thing happened in the process of time. Um, the parents kind of sat the tent, and I love this too, because they sat their girls down. They said, you know what? You live here. We love you so much. We're going to require that you go to switch. See, <laughs> see um, I was raised in that crazy era, era where, where um, if you were a teenager and you lived in mom's house and eat mom's food, you... You, you didn't get to pick what you did. Yeah, church, church wasn't optional. Dad, I'm sick. Get up, boy, we'll pray for you at church. 
Dad, I feel like I'm going to die. There's no better place to die than church. We can do the funeral right there. Come on, son. So they sat down. That's why I love them. They sat down. I said, girls, in a real sweet way, you're going to have to go to Switch. And this is no lie. This, this young lady walked into Switch the first time. She told Pastor James. She said, you just need to know I'm only here because my parents are making me be here. Now, as a student pastor, that's your favorite thing to hear because you know that's the one God's going to get. Like, you know, oh, it's on now. So Pastor James said, fine, we, however you get here, we're just glad you're here, you know. And uh, so anyways, then this young lady decided she wanted to go on outreach. That's the next step. So her parents, and she wanted to go on a mission trip. So her parents said, well, you, you need to tithe. They had the tithe conversation again with a teenager. Well, you know, she had a typical teenager job, just a few hours here and there. And so her paycheck that week was $30. So she tithed $3. In the meantime, she had sent a prayer request, not a financial request, just a prayer request into our office to say, I want to go on a mission trip. I've got to, I, I need the Lord to provide the money. Will you guys just pray with me? Well, our team responded, and there's ways we respond to that, and we have resources set aside for that kind of thing. So our team responded, we will pray. But Katie called from our office and said, not only are we praying for you, uh, but we're going to commit $300 to your mission trip. That's a hundredfold return. How many would sign up for that today? Jesus, take the wheel. Amen. So then she's at Switch, and she Switch breaks out into life groups. So she went to her life group, and she broke out with them. She said, hey, will y'all pray with me? I want to go on a mission trip, and I'm just praying God will provide the money, and God will help me get more hours at work and that kind of thing. And, and one of the girls that she didn't really know in her life group after it was over pulled her aside and said, hey, when you were sharing that, I felt like God, teenagers, by the way, this is why we do switch. One of the teenagers said, I just felt like when you're speaking, God wanted me to give all the money I had. I have $50. Here's $50 for your mission trip. Now, if you're naive, you think this girl's $3 in tithing is about a building. No, 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 no. God's building a disciple. Right? So then, it doesn't stop there. Then, then she gets a new job, pays better, has more hours. Still tithing. And now she's joined a switch serve team. And she's serving. And here's what I think. My God, if I could just get adults to figure this out. <laughs> Like teenagers don't seem to have a problem with it. It's just us, those, that, oh, those, those of us who are older and wiser can't figure it out. And here's what I'm saying. Stewardship, discipleship are so not. That girl, I, you know, I, I believe she's going to go on her mission trip. But this is what our, her life's already changed because she took some next steps. So on this giving ladder, let me show you this real quick. Here's how it works. We all start at the bottom. We start at p as potential givers. What's a potential giver? It's a person who could give financially to the kingdom of God, but for whatever reason hasn't. Whether they haven't seen it as a part of discipleship, they don't understand the value of it, they don't understand the necessity, they don't understand those things. They, they just don't. We're not there in our faith yet. We're not there in understanding. Or maybe we're just at that place where we just haven't trusted God, but we start as potential givers. The next step up are emerging givers. These are people who give, but it's kind of sporadic, not any necessary amount. They may give $50 here. They may walk by and put $10 in. You know, next month, maybe they get inspired and write a check for $100. They just kind of give sporadic. We celebrate that. We celebrate that because they've taken their next step in their giving journey and their discipleship. They're moving in that direction, but they're now emerging givers. By the way, last weekend, we had four families give for the first time to the kingdom of God through Pathway. And we celebrate that because that is a next step. That is in our growth and our discipleship, amen? So emerging givers, then consistent givers. These are people, they're not giving what we'd call a tithe. I'll talk about that in a minute. But these are people who give consistently. Maybe it's $100 a week, or maybe it's $400 a month, or maybe it's $300 every time they get paid. They're, they're consistent giving. They are trusting and trying to follow God more and more, um, and, and we celebrate that. Then there's what the Bible calls a tithe giver. Now, I've been a tithe giver since I was nine years old, so it just makes sense to me. I understand math. I'm really good with numbers. If I have 10 and I give one away, I have nine. But I also understand kingdom. When I have 10 and I give one away, God blesses the nine to be more than the 10. I understand that 
because I've been taught that. And so I've always, it's easy for me to trust God in the tithe and to give him the first 10%. That's why it's a tithe. It's the first 10%. It takes faith to give the first. It doesn't take faith to give what's left over. And when I honor God, what's going to be the best, the first or what's left over? I don't know. I don't want to serve a God that's only good enough for what's left over. I want to serve a God that is so powerful and so good. He's worthy of the first. That's just me personally, right? You understand? And so that's the first 10% of our increase. And people say, well, that's Old Testament law. And I don't have time to get into a debate with the Pharisees because here's the bottom of the line. I'm not here to try to convince you to do anything other than what God wants you to do. But I will say this. You need to understand the difference between what the law sanctioned, what it ratified, what it said amen to, and you need to understand the difference in what stopped at the cross and passed through the cross, okay? So for instance, um, the law sanctioned animal sacrifice. It ratified tithing. In other words, tithing was actually started 2,500 years before the law. The, The law just said amen to it, right? Davidic worship passed through the cross, Animal sacrifice stopped at the cross, but tithing passed through the cross. Here's how I know, because Jesus said, you should tithe. Jesus said. People say, well, he only said it one time. Okay. <laughs> Let me help you. I'm going to tell you the same thing you told your kids. How many times... Gonna set you free. Gonna set you free. So, and that, I think this is why the, the tithe is so special to God. And it is special to God. And I think this is why it gets really fun when you start tithing. God starts doing things, opens the windows of heaven, rebukes the devourer. I think all these promises are around the tithe. Here's why. Because Hebrews 7, also in your New Testament, Hebrews 7 says, Here mortal men receive the tithe, but there... He receives it, and it is testimony that he lives. Here's what it says. Here, I put it in the box, but when I let go of it into that box, it falls in the hands of Jesus and becomes a testimony that I believe he's alive. It's powerful. And so that's the, that's the tithe giver, right? And then there's extravagant givers. Those are the people that give above that. And, and Julie and I, we have always given above the tithe. We just always have. Even, even in this Arise commitment, we're having budget meetings to sit down. And we, we're like, hey, we got to sit down, go over our budget again. Because God not only wants us to commit all of our savings, but he actually wants us to change our budget so we can give more. You know, that's legal. Yes. You can downgrade from 400 channels to 100 channels. You can, you, hey, you can have a little Folgers in your cup and save your Starbucks money. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> so here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking everybody right now, here's what I'm going to say right now. Everybody knows where you're at on that ladder. So pastor, how are we going to do this? Well, the kingdom of God can only be built through sacrifice. How are we going to do this, pastor? Well, everybody knows where you're at on that ladder. Here's my question. Where does God want you to be on that ladder? That's all I'm asking you to answer. Where does God want you to be on that ladder? Never going to ask you to do more than God asks you to do. Never going to ask you to do less than God asks you to do. Where does God want... Now, some of you are like, I'm not going to pray about that because you already know. (laughs) And you figure denial is easier than rebellion. (laughs) Have we not all been there? Let's just own that. Like... I, there's been times in my life I didn't pray about stuff because I knew the answer. Right? But here's what I'm saying. As a church, we're ever, I'm going to ask everybody to commit to make a commitment. And all I'm asking you to do is do whatever God tells you to do. But I'm asking you, where are you at on this ladder and where does God want you to be? Right? And, and if you're sitting here, well, to be where God wants me to be, i got to sell something. I got to change my budget, then here's what I'd say. Sell something to change your budget. Right? Now, if you're like, I think I'm right where God wants me to be. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm glad you're ahead of the rest of us, but we'll celebrate that. We'll celebrate that. Just do that. You do you, boo. (laughs) 
right? <laughs> but I think God's going to do it. He's going to do it through us, but he's going to do it. Amen? I'm ready to see what he does. Aren't you? Woo-hoo! I'm excited. All right, hey, why don't you let me preach for a minute? You got time for that? All right, turn with me to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. And uh, last week we started this series that we're calling Arise, kind of the launching pad for this 24-month initiative. And we talked about defining moments. And again, I hope you caught up with us via video or podcast, however you stay up to date on all of that. But I hope, I hope you are tracking along with us. If not, go back and listen to that. And I hope you're in a life group. I know our life group meets this afternoon um, and, and we'll be doing week two of the life group curriculum. So I, I hope you're doing all that and tracking. But last week we started with the life of Abraham and we're gonna kind of stick to the life of Abraham. And, and here's the way I wrote the series. And this is what I want you to understand. I sat down. Now I have followed God for many years. You know, um, I'm older than I look. I know I look 24 but I'm old, a few years older than that. And so I've followed God for a long time. And, and I've also pastored. I pastored this church for eight years. I was on other staffs before that. And I was raised in the home of a pastor. Here's what I'm going to say. When I sat down to write this, I thought, if I were going to put five weeks, like if I were going to write a book and in five weeks tell people that some of the most critical things I could tell you to move forward with God, to move forward in your faith, to really arise and do what God's called you to do, it would be these five things. And, and last week we talked about defining moments because it's a defining moment when I make that commitment and when God speaks to me and when I choose to step out and I step into that defining moment. But this week, this week I want to talk about another huge key. And so we're going to have fun. But in, in, in Hebrews 11 verse 8, it says this. It says, Abraham trusted God. Abraham trusted the time out. I'm going to read the rest, but for a minute. Abraham trusted God. Listen to me very carefully. It doesn't say God proved himself trustworthy to Abraham. It says, Abraham trusted God. He chose, listen to me. I've had a lot of people say, I'm learning to trust God. Let me help you with something. Stop learning and trust him. Because when you say you're learning to trust God, what you're kind of saying is, as God proves himself trustworthy, then I'm going to trust him more. And what I'm telling you is Abraham, he didn't have a relationship with God. God didn't appear to Abraham and say, now, Abraham, I'm going to hang out with you for the next two or three years so that hopefully at the end of that, when I ask you to do something really big, you're going to do it. Like the day God showed up, he said, I want you to load the donkey and go that way. And Abraham, listen to me, chose to trust God. Abraham trusted God. And when God told him to leave home and go far away to another land that he promised to give him, Abraham obeyed. I love this last sentence. Away he went, not even knowing where he was going. Now that's trust. That's trust. So today I want to talk to you about the power of trust. Because I think if you're ever going to do what God's called you to do, it's not that you're going to have to learn to trust him. You're going to have to choose to trust him. And there's a difference. So you might want to write these things down. Number one, number one, you need to understand that trust is the result of faith. There's, there's faith and belief, and then there's trust. And these are not always the same. Let me explain the difference. To, to come to faith is a combination. Faith to me is a combination of belief and trust. So when someone's coming to faith, they're believing and trusting. It's almost two steps in one for me. Let me explain the difference. When I, when I come to faith in Jesus, I start by believing, right? But then I trust in him for salvation, right? You got saved the same way. You came to faith. We call it faith. We're saved by grace through faith. But here's how it happened. First of all, you believed. You said, Jesus is Savior, right? God sent him to pay the bill I couldn't pay, to keep the law I couldn't keep, and to reconnect me to the God I couldn't find. And you said, I believe that. Then you said, now I'm going to trust him for salvation. And you stepped in. You said, I believe what Jesus did is enough. On my best day, it's enough. On my worst day, it's enough. If I screw up tomorrow, what Jesus did is still enough. I have a relationship with God because I trust in what Jesus did because I know I can't trust in what I do. So I am trusting in Jesus to be my Savior. 
I'm trusting in his sacrifice. I'm trusting in his atoning work. I am trusting. Now, I believe that's how I came to trust. We call that faith, right? And we need to understand that, that and to me, this is the challenge of, of East Texas of the Bible Belt. It is completely possible to believe in a God you don't trust. Right? Because there are a lot of people. There are a lot of people, and, and they'll say this. Well, I believe there's a God. I believe there's a big man upstairs. I believe it's in one of those country songs that I sing. Right? Sometimes they even thank God for unanswered prayers, just like the psalmist Garth Brooks told us to do. <laughs> Amen. And I believe there's a God. Granny talked about him. She prayed. I come every now and then when I can on Easter. I believe there's a God. But there's belief and then there's trust. Jesus said it this way, you believe there's a God, so does every demon in hell. Like one thing demons and atheists don't have in common. <laughs> demons believe there's a God. Right? But what does it look like to trust? Believe. Trust. Um, a lot of people know this story, but back in the 19th century, um, there was a, a tightrope walker. His, his, I can't say his French name. He was from France, but his English name was Charles Blondin or Blondine. I don't know what, whichever way makes you happy, potato, potato. Anyways, um, and he wanted to walk on a tightrope across Niagara Falls. And so he came to the States to do this, and he stretched the tightropes 1,100 feet across, 160-something feet above the water. And, uh, and so he would put on these shows, essentially, where he'd go out and walk across. And like the first time, he, he gets out on the, on, the, on the rope across the agony. He's got his pole, you know, and he's doing that tightrope thing. If you've ever seen a tightrope walker, they have the pole. Then he kind of throws the pole down, and he kind of goes back across. Some stories say he stopped on the middle, cooked breakfast, and ate it. I don't know. Sounds like a good story to me. I guess tightrope walking can, you know, burn some calories, and you got to, you know, everything's, bacon. everything's better with bacon including tightropes. Anyway, so, um, but, but as the story goes, then one time he grabs this wheelbarrow. And, uh, and, and so he gets this wheelbarrow and he puts some bricks or potatoes in it and, and he puts it, you know, right here on this, on this tightrope and he takes the, the, the bricks, the wheelbarrow full of bricks all the way across like that, right? And, and, then, he, and then he turns around and then he brings it all the way back. Now these huge crowds would come and watch him. And they would just marvel and they would cheer. And so he gets back to this other side. He puts the wheelbarrow down. And he says, how many of you believe I could put a man or a person in that wheelbarrow and take them across the tightrope? The whole crowd, everybody, we believe. You're amazing. Woo! And then he says, which one of you? will get in the wheelbarrow. And right then, they found out there's a difference between belief and trust. Because every hand, it went from church to a funeral. It was like, whoa! You know what I'm saying? And I think sometimes, in fact, I think all the time, God's asking us, not do you believe in me, but will you trust me? It's not, it's not whether you believe in me, it's will you trust me with your life? There's a difference between believing and trusting. And I think sometimes so many people believe in a God they don't trust. Oh, he's up there, big man. I hope, I be, you know, there's this disconnect. Really. I believe in a God who gets me to heaven. I just can't really trust him to help me on the earth. I believe in a God who will get me to heaven, but, but I can't trust his word, his principles, his precepts, his values, his plan. There's a disconnect, and that disconnect, I believe, is trust. And we need to understand when the Bible talks about faith, it is not talking about belief. It is talking about belief that moves us to trust. That's what it's talking about. Here's the second thing that I think we need to admit as we're having this conversation about trust. But trust, trust is challenging. Can I get an amen? Amen. It is not always easy to trust God. Don't you wish it was, right? 
Here's why it's not always easy to trust God, because seldom do we really ever see or understand completely what God is even doing. I I love this. uh, I love the Bible because the Bible uses humans. Uh, God wants to use humans so much that he made his son one. So the Bible's full of these humans. They're not superheroes. Abraham wasn't a superhero. Elijah isn't a superhero. Elisha is not a, these are just men, right? David wasn't a superhero. They're all messed up. And Abraham, he has some blemishes on his record. Does anybody have a few blemishes on your record? Abraham lied to some kings, was willing for his wife to be married to a king. If I ever came up with that plan, I wouldn't have to worry about God getting me. Julie would kill me. You understand what I'm saying? He has some blemishes, but, but here's the thing we need to understand is that Abraham, he, he became the father of faith, not just because he believed, but because he trusted. He walked out this journey and his journey had some messy moments on it because trust is challenging. If trust isn't challenging, then we wouldn't have Ishmael. Because you remember the story, right? You remember the story where Abraham and Sarah, God had promised them uh, a nation. He had promised them a, a child. And we get a few years into this and there's still no baby. And then they do what some of us have done. And that is start saying, you know, probably we need to help God out a little bit. Like, you know, God, he, he's, he means well, but he just needs our help. Like he doesn't understand everything about this. He doesn't know exactly how this works. Oh, you've never done that. Liar. Anyways, <laughs> and so, so they get together and have this plan that, okay, since God hasn't really made Sarah pregnant, she's not conceived. Abraham, I'm going to give you my maidservant, Hagar. I want you to sleep with her and see if God will give us a child through her. And Abraham said, well, I'll take one for the team. And so, um, and so he sleeps with Hagar, and then Hagar has a baby. They named the baby Ishmael, right? And we find out that's not at all what God wanted, right? And so if trust, if trust isn't challenging, there probably wouldn't have been an Ishmael. And truthfully, if trust wasn't challenging, probably some of us wouldn't have the Ishmaels that we have. Mm. Amen. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, very familiar very familiar proverb. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Time out. You see that with all your heart? Here's why. Your heart has a capacity that your brain doesn't. You need to understand that's why Jesus uh, in the Bible and God is always dealing with our heart. Our heart has the capacity to see what our brain cannot see, to conceptually take in what our brain cannot take in. Our heart has a greater capacity for belief and faith than our brain. In fact, faith doesn't come from your brain at all. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth and believe in our... Notice it it leaves your brain out of it. Some of you would go farther with God if you just leave your brain out of it. You need to write that down. (laughs) And so it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. In fact, Paul said this way, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened so that you could see the hope of your calling, that you could see the power of God towards those who believe, and you could see how big your inheritance is because of Jesus, that the eyes of your heart. And so your heart has a capacity your head just doesn't have. And so that's why the, the, the writer of Proverbs, who is very wise, says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all, not some, in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct your path. See, it's um, trust, trust. Trust means, biblical trust, this word trust here, it actually means to put all your weight on. How much is all? All is all. All all can ever be is all. All is all. And so if I put if I put all my weight on the Lord, how much weight can I put on my own understanding? None. Most of you y'all would pass my math class. <laughs> right? 
And so we need to understand when the Bible, when the Bible's talking about trust, it's talking about putting all your weight. Isn't that what Abram had to go to a place he didn't know where was? Is that all your trust? I mean, some of you won't go to the supermarket without putting it in your GPS. Am I right? Like we never think I'm going that way. We think, where are we going? How long is, is there a Chick-fil-A? Is there a Whataburger en route? Is there a clean bathroom? Where's the biggest gas station? Abraham just loaded the donkey. Put all, we need to understand in the life of faith that mystery is more important than understanding. Mystery is more important than revelation or understanding. Uh, revelation and understanding, that's where faith was active. Mystery is where faith is active. You cannot live a life of faith if you do not have mystery. And for some of us, we're like, well, I just wish I understood everything about God. That would mean one of two things. Either number one, you had become God. Or number two, you've brought God down to your size. If we're going to follow God, we're going to have to understand and we're going to have to accept that we are simply not going to understand him. He is bigger than your brain. That's why he gave you a heart. And so in the life of faith, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without mystery, I can't, there's no opportunity for faith. So the Christian life, as we follow God, what grows, our understanding grows. But as our understanding grows, mystery has to grow. Because we have to be able to live the life of faith. See, we want understanding to grow until there's no mystery. At that point, you're no longer living in faith at all. And so this is that challenge that as mystery grows, understanding grows, as understanding grows, mystery has to grow. And this is how we have an opportunity to live a life of faith. Mystery is what gives us a reason to trust. So we need to understand that trust and understanding, according to this proverb, trust and understanding are actually mutually exclusive. They're diametrically opposed. opposed. They are opposite ends of the spectrum. There is trusting and there is understanding. Notice it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Notice it says that first, there's a divine order here, first. Why? Because when we start with God, we're trusting. And when we start with us, we're understanding. Trust in the Lord, lean not on your own. Right? When we trust in the Lord first, when, when we start with God, when we start with God, we're walking in trust. Well, I don't know, this is what God told me to do. Well, how's that work out? I don't know. It's what God, people said, how's this whole thing going to work out? Let me help you with something right now. I don't know. I just know what I'm supposed to do. Really? I, I just know what I'm supposed to do. That's really all I'm responsible. I'm not responsible to understand how this culminates, how it terminates. They're like, are we going to do it all in cash? I believe so. When are we going to do it? Amen. I can tell you this, we can start moving dirt in about three months. I can tell you that. And I can tell you after that, it's about 18, 18 to 20 months and we can move in. I can tell you those things. How all this works out, can't tell you. Why? Not in charge. Not in charge. I've learned a long time ago, it's going to be easier to follow God when I accept that he doesn't have to explain everything to me in great detail. He just has to tell me what my next step is. And so you need to understand, listen, you need to understand that your understanding is actually what's warring against your faith. Because they're mutually exclusive ideas. Listen, God, in the beginning, God, he started with him. See, our natural impulse is to start with us. Well, here's what I'd like to do. Here's what I understand. Here's what I know. Here's what I think. But God, when he wrote the Bible, he didn't start with us. He started with him. In the beginning, God, he didn't take a lot of time to draw it out, didn't write a book about who he was, didn't have an autobiography to sell you. He didn't try to explain to your psyche that he was God, didn't even say, let me prove who I am and then talk about what we're going to do. In the beginning, God, he just started with him. And when, when God made Adam and Eve and said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, take dominion, it worked really well until, until they changed the order. As long as it started with God, things were working. But then all of a sudden, Adam said, wait, I, I, I want to be like God. 
I want to know what God knows. I want to understand. Do you understand that the whole fall of creation can be summed up in this? One man leaned on his own understanding. He started with him. And can I tell you something from my experience? When I start with me, life gets more painful. Right? This is good preaching right here. This set you free, man. When we start with us, man, that's when life starts hurting. Right? Because, listen, when we start with us, we're moving into understanding. Understanding is what wars against our faith. The kingdom comes through faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. See, um, can I tell you something? <laughs> the proof that we're not trusting God is seen when we start leaning on our own understanding. In fact, the proof, the proof that we're not trusting God is seen in what we run to when we don't understand. What do you run to when you don't understand? Because it could be Jim Beam or it could be Krispy Kreme. <laughs> it could be Netflix. It could be the mall. It could be the arms of another person. Oh, I'm sorry. Did that? So I'm like, oh, <laughs> you need to break up with them. Anyway, so um, <clears throat> the proof that we're not trusting in God is when we run to anything other than Him when we don't understand. I need to understand that understanding wars against trust. Trust is is always going to be a challenge, but here's what I know. We're always going to experience less when we lean on what we understand. The only way to experience what God has for you is to trust, which is the third thing if you want to write it down. Trust, trust inherits the promise. Trust inherits the promise. Um, Abraham did not become the father of faith and inherit the promised land. Because he believed in God. He inherited the promise and became the father of faith because he trusted in God. Trust is what, trust is what the promise comes through. It actually comes through our trust. Now, this is a challenge, it's a battle. And, and, and again, I love Abraham because he's human. In fact, there's this cool conversation um, that Abraham has with God. There'd been several defining moments. There'd been things that had happened. God had changed his name. Uh, he had made a covenant with God. And I mean, there's all these cool moments and we get to Genesis chapter 17. And this is 24 years after the promise, 24 years after God had given the promise. Abraham's like 98, 99 years old. And again, God comes to Abraham and says, hey, still gonna do what I promised. And Abraham says something that many of us have said in our own ways. Abraham said, God, I wish that Ishmael could walk before you. I wish that Ishmael could walk. But let me say another way. God, I hear you, but I wish you could just bless what I understand. Now, I know you've never done that. But for the weaker of us, some of us have. God, I wish you could bless what I understand. In other words, it's just too hard to try. I remember early on in, in the history of our church, we, we started the church, and I don't want to walk you through the story. I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, but essentially when we started the church, we, we, we were financially secure. We had some finances. We were in business, da, da, da. And um, just right into starting the church, we'd, the economy had taken a hit. If you remember 2008, 2009, 2010, economy had taken a hit. And, and we had made, number one, I'd, I'd made, I felt like, some not so wise decisions. And one of those mainly was who I was in um, business with. And, um, and when the crunch happened and hit, 
essentially the bottom line was we ended up losing everything. So we went from having some financial security, not really needing a salary from the church, knowing the church. When you start a church, let me help you with something. When you start a church, it's not for the money. If you own a business, let me help you with a comparison just real quick. A church is a business you run where people decide if they ever will pay for the service or not. So you don't do that for the money. Because I can't invoice people for my time. I'm not an attorney. Right? And so you don't do it for the money. So, so we started the church and we were fine. And then all of a sudden we, had, we, we lost everything and we had nothing. And we felt like God wanted us to keep doing the church. At the time, the church was maybe 100 people. We were in the Ramada. <laughs> Things are looking good. And we didn't tell the church, obviously, what was going on with us. The elders knew, but the church didn't because the church isn't a support group for the pastor. You're not here to make me feel better about myself. And you're not here to take care of me. I'm, I'm here to take care of you. And so we said, we can't take an infant church and make it about, can we help the pastor? That'd be silly. I've been to that church, by the way, where the church is the support group for the pastor, and it is screwed up. And so, <laughs> so we weren't going to do that. And so, honestly, kind of in, in silence, we're suffering a little bit because we, I mean, you know, when, you're, when your bills are X and your income is zero, it's hard to make that math work really well. And, and we felt like God wanted us to be faithful to the church. And so I came up with some ideas. I'd tell Julie, I'm going to go get a job at FedEx and, and I'm going to work all night at FedEx and then I'll pastor the church during the day. And she's like, honey, that's crazy. And I, I know, but it sounded good. And, um, <laughs> And so we're, we're going through this season, and finally we just, we hit a breaking point for me, and, and one of our, it seems like one of our kids needed to go to the doctor, my oldest son needed a pair of shoes, and when you're a dad and you can't take your child to the doctor because you don't have the money and you don't have insurance, and you can't buy your son a pair of shoes and his feet are scrunched in his shoes, reality hits. And I remember I got up that morning, I think it was, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was in the morning, I got up that morning, I told Julie, I said, hey... Um, I, I think, I think I'm done. I think I'm going to resign the church and, uh, I'm going to make some calls. I've got some friends. We'll, we'll get a job, uh, in the Metroplex and we'll just move and we'll have insurance and, um, and, you know, a job <laughs> and an income and we can buy our children's shoes and take them to the doctor. And I think at that point she, she was honestly somewhat relieved, I think for, a moment. And, uh, and now here's what you need to know. Some people are like, well, you're mad at God. God didn't come through for you. No, I wasn't mad at God at all. I can prove it. I left there and went to my quiet time. I wasn't mad at God. In fact, this is pretty much what I told God that morning. God, I believe, I believe that you want to do everything you've spoken. I don't believe I'm strong enough to trust you anymore. I have no doubt in who you are and what you want to do. I'm tired, though, and I'm hurting, and I can't trust you anymore. I, I got to take care of my family. And so I was mad at God, and I said, God, I'm just going to trust you. will help us find a leader for the church or help get everybody into a good church or something. And so then, then I opened my Bible, and in my Bible reading, I was reading where, where Hagar left and, and ran away with Ishmael. And, uh, and, and she runs into an angel, and, and the angel says, hey, where are you going? And all of a sudden, I was Hagar. Because Hagar pretty much said, I don't know where I'm going, I just know where I'm leaving. And all of a sudden, I'm in the Bible story. And I felt like God was saying, hey, son, wh where are you going? I don't know, God, I just know where I'm leaving. I just know what's not working, I know what hurts too bad. I know what I don't understand. And I'm heading towards something I can make sense of. And then in, in the story, the angel says, no, I want you to go back and submit to Sarah. And all of a sudden, and I know in typologies that usually the church in the Bible is represented by females. And so I knew God was saying, no, son, I hear you. I hear you. But I want you to go back and submit to the church. And, um, and then right after that, here's, here's what God says, essentially. And I'll make Ishmael, I'll make, I'll make him a great nation. And this is what God, in that moment, it's what God said to me. It's, I was just reading the Bible. 
God, I believe you can do it. I just don't trust that I'm the guy. I don't trust that I'm strong enough to stick in this. I'm hurting. I'm tired. And, and we just can't do it. And here's what God said. I hear you, son. I hear you. I want you to go back and submit to the church. And I'm going to do everything I promised. I called the elders and I said, I need to ask for my job back. They said, did you quit? I said, yes, but now I'm not quitting anymore. <laughs> One of them, Paul, who's, he's been here since the beginning too, Paul said, well, Marty, I wouldn't have blamed you. <laughs> Bless his heart. He, he just knew what we had walked through, so I wouldn't have blamed you. And um, I can tell you right after that, someone anonymously they called one of the elders. Um, I assume, you know, obviously they went to our church, but they called one of the elders and said, we don't know what's going on, uh, but the Lord's put on our heart to give the pastor a special offering. And they handed that elder a check for $10,000. I went and paid like five house payments because I'm not dumb. <laughs> I mean, we tithed on it. We tithed on it. But I took all I was left and I started making house payments. I'm like, we got a place to live for like five months. Praise Jesus. <laughs> right after that, a couple in the church approached an elder and said, hey, we just want to give an offering to the church, a special offering of $100,000. In the next six months, the church doubled in size. A few more months and we moved from the Ramada into here. I know it's easier to ask God to bless what we can understand. But the promise only comes through where and how we trust him. Abraham says, God, I wish you'd just bless, bless Ishmael. And then God says this in Genesis chapter 17, verse 21. God says this, basically his answer to Abraham is, No, my covenant I will establish with Isaac. Here's what he says. The promise only comes through trust. The promise will not come through what you understand. The promise will only come through trust. Many, many Sunday morning breakthroughs are lost on the battlefield of Monday morning trust. Because here's the challenge. The challenge is we know we're supposed to trust God, but we live in this world. Right? I mean, we know we're supposed to trust God, but my God, my, my rent's due, my electric bill. I know I'm supposed to trust God, but... And the problem is we start trying to mix the sacred with the secular. And we start trying to trust God while leaning on our own understanding. We try to be half in the wheelbarrow and half on the ground. The Bible has a word for this. It's called double-mindedness. James talks about it in James chapter 1, verse 6. He says, but when you ask him, watch this, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Trust is putting all of our weight. Be sure that your, that your, that your faith, that your trust is in God alone. Do not waver for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Watch verse 7, very key. Such people should not expect to receive anything from God. Do you see that? It's, listen to me. Now listen, that sounds mean, but I'm going to explain it in just a minute. What, look at verse 8. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world. Now, the original version uses a word, double-mindedness. If you have NIV, uh, King James, New King James is going to say double-mindedness. What does it mean? Their loyalty. In other words, they're leaning on God and leaning on the world. They're trying to trust in God and trust in the world. And, and this is what it says. It makes them unstable. It makes them unstable. This is the reason why people, you see Christians, they're in one week, out the next week. One week is a scripture on Facebook. The next week, they're in the club. They're unstable. They're in, they're up, they're out, they're in. Why? Because they're trying to trust in God, and they're also trying to lean on their own understanding. And James says, don't think you'll receive anything from God. Now, that sounds mean, but it's not mean. It's just fact, because here's what he's saying. The promise of God only comes through trust. It's not that God doesn't want to bless your understanding. It's that he can't. 
He can only bless what he says. He can only bless what he wants. He can only bless what his will is. He cannot bless your will. He can only bless his will. And that's why it says now we, we become living sacrifices and now we can prove the will of God. Why does he want us to know his will? Because he can only bless his will. And you need to understand that whatever God wants to do in your life and what God wants to do in our church, it can only be done one way. We have to get in the wheelbarrow. We have to say, I'm going to trust God. I'm not going to understand. I'm not going to look at what I can see. I'm going to walk by faith. I'm not going to look for what I can perceive, understand, figure out. I'm going to just trust in God. Because there's only one way that I'm going to inherit the promise that God has for me. Trust. That's why trust is so powerful. Because his promise only comes through your trust. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Hebrews 11.8. Abraham trusted God. Abraham trusted God. God, and it was by faith, that's trust, that he obeyed and said, I'm going to go not knowing where he was going. Listen, God wants to do amazing things through your life. He's got plans you can't even fathom. The only way to get there, trust. Trust in the Lord. Lean not on your own on your own understanding. All your ways acknowledge him. He will direct your path. He has a desired outcome for your life. The only way to get there is trust. Can you say amen? Can you give him praise for that? That's a good word. <laughs> Why don't you stand, stand with me? And I know these weekends that we're doing Arise are a little bit longer. Um, because we're having to talk about so much, but thank you for staying with me and thank you for being committed to be here and being committed to be in your life group and take this journey with us. Thank you for committing to pray about where you're at on the giving ladder and where God wants you to be. Listen, all we have to do is what God's called us to do. All we have to do is what God's asked. All we have to do is trust him. And no, that's not easy, but that's all we have to do. Amen. Will you bow your heads with me and...